Well, good morning, y'all. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler, lead pastor here at River Run. And if you weren't here last week, before I kind of begin here, if you weren't here last week, I highly encourage you guys to go to our Facebook page, go to our website, and watch Bill Jurgen's message from last week. Bill just did an amazing job just helping us to understand and just from his own experience, his own spiritual journey, why we can faithfully follow Jesus and why we should trust him. And we can do that not just through our own experiences, but also through just an intelligent understanding of what God has done through history through Jesus Christ. So I highly encourage you that. Last week, uh, he gave out his, it was based on his book that he just recently uh, wrote called Faith Leap. And last week we gave these out for free. There's still some left. If you would like to pick one up, just come and see me after um, our service and love to give that to you. Or if you know somebody who would just, this would really have an impact, who's dealing with some, you know, some faith doubts or anything like that, this would be a great resource to pass along as well. Well, today we are starting a new series that we're going to be uh, looking at for the next six weeks. It's going to be a little bit longer series than we normally deal with because this is a big subject. It's a big topic. And it's one of those topics where you can't just like give a 30 minute message and we all just go, okay, life is better. Life is easy. Let's just go. Or you just give these five little steps. Here's five little easy little steps. You do these little five little steps, and then everything's hunky-dory. You can just go right out and right off into the sunset. Now, this is a big topic. And the topic that we're going to be looking at over the next six weeks is the topic of suffering. Now, you may be thinking like, oh, man, okay, so let me get this straight. So we're going to have to suffer through six weeks of messages on suffering. Is that some kind of like illustration to learn perseverance or whatever? No, I hope not. That's not the goal. The goal of this is, is at the end of six weeks that we would all, including myself, that all of us, would gain a, a, a clear, better understanding of, of God and of life and of, and of suffering and to have the tools uh, that God gives us when we do walk through the hard times of life, when we do go through the things of, of suffering and, and how we walk those out in relationship with God and how we walk that out with, in relationship with each other. Uh, because I, you know, I believe that God desires for us, even when we walk through the this, this suffering, that we would be able to walk through it and with, a, with a sense of strength. Even Jesus said, that we would live, build our house on a rock, right? A firm rock that not if, but when the storms of life, when the hard times come, that we would be able to withstand those difficult times. That we wouldn't be, you know, that we wouldn't just kind of like go, you know what, suffering's too hard, it's too difficult, so let's just kind of stick our head in the sand and pretend that it'll never happen, we'll never suffer, nothing, we'll never have anything bad happen, and then all of a sudden, we're just not prepared for that hurricane that just comes and just blows us away. That we are not that football player who just kind of is walking down and just is focused on the, the end zone and not focusing on anything else with a big old grin on his face until that lineman comes and bam, knocks him off his feet. The thing is, is that what we want to do at the end of this is to understand not if, but when we go through those hard times, how can we walk through them, you know, in a, in a place of, of strength and awareness or what to do when we handle and when we go through those things. But let me just say right off the bat, suffering stinks. St suffering is hard. Suffering is horrible. It's just horrible, right? I don't think anybody goes, no, I kind of disagree with that. I don't think suffering's horrible at all. I don't think there's anybody in this room that has gone through some, some suffering in their lives and, and thought that it wasn't horrible, difficult, and, and just awful. And God knows that it's horrible. But then that begs the question, doesn't it? If God knows that suffering is horrible, why does God allow suffering? You know, suffering is really those points in our lives where we have like the greatest doubts about God, 
when we're dealing with something really hard, whether that's an emotional brokenness, whether it's a physical brokenness, and, and we're crying out to God, God, why? Why is this happening to me? Why are you letting this happen to me? Why am I going through this? This is awful. It may not even be you. It could be somebody else. God, why are you allowing that to happen to them, to those people? Why is that happening? This is awful. This is horrible. And in those moments, we tend to have our greatest doubts about God because we, I don't know about you, but you know, maybe you've had those thoughts in your head that, you know what? Suffering is horrible. And if it's horrible, how can you be a loving God? Maybe you're not a loving God because a loving God, how would he allow this suffering to happen? And it, maybe he is a suff, uh, loving God, but if he's a loving God, then he's not all powerful because he can't take away the suffering. And so that creates the conundra in our lives. But what we're going to do is over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some people who looked at that conundrum and looked at it from a different perspective. That conundrum that there's three realities. God is all-powerful. God is love. And there is suffering. How do we reconcile those three things? And so that's what we're going to look at over the next two weeks. We are going to look at a, a very specific kind of questions in part one and part two, if you will. And that is, if there is a loving God, why do bad things happen to good people? Maybe you've asked that question before. You know, you can, you can answer that question theologically. Well, let's look at it theologically. Well, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short to the glory of God. We've all sinned. And then we can go back to the words of Jesus when someone asks Jesus, hey, good teacher, blah, 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 blah. And then Jesus responds, hey, who are you calling good? No one is good except for one, except for God. None of us are good. And all of us have sinned. But if you've lived life long enough, right, you've probably looked at it and go, hmm, all right, that may be true theologically, and we're all sinners, and none of us are perfect and all that. But I go and I look at so-and-so over here, and they would give the shirt off, shirt off their own back. They would do anything for you. They are just incredible, kind and humble and generous and sweet. And they are just completely ravaged by this horrible thing. And I know these people over here, they're narcissistic, they're self-centered, they're horrible. But it seems like life always seems pretty easy to them. That feels incredibly unjust, right? Right? Have you ever kind of looked at that before and go look at that and go, wait a minute, that just doesn't seem fair. So if there's a loving God, why do bad things happen to good people? Now, let me just kind of tell you as a disclaimer as we begin this, this journey. Um, this message series isn't about looking to me as a person who has done and has gone through great suffering, but, I, but I've made it through, you know, strong and faithful and, and a perfect human being. In fact, reality is I've gone through my challenges. I've gone through some hard stuff. Um, you know, I've dealt with fear and anxiety and brokenness of people that treated me and how I've treated other people and all that stuff but I've not really gone through a sense of deep suffering. In 51 years of life, I've seen people, some in this room right here, who've gone through some really, really, really hard, difficult, horrible stuff. This isn't about looking to me, and I am the person that you would probably say, but Tyler, you don't understand. And there's probably some truth in that. And oftentimes when we do feel and we kind of go through suffering, we do kind of tend to gravitate towards somebody else that we've seen either has gone through the, the same kind of suffering that we have or who've gone through a whole lot more. I remember a time when I knew this young man, he was in his upper 20s, great guy. His name was Chris, Chris Cox. 
Chris had ALS. He developed ALS early on when he was about 17 or 18 years old. It's a, you know, it's fine motors where you slowly start, you can't use your body anymore. Your body just no longer works and you just kind of, you die. Well, um, when I met Chris, Chris had, he was in his upper 20s. He had gone to school and, and he had gone to grad school and he was a counselor. And by that time, uh, Chris um, couldn't drive. He was in a wheelchair. He couldn't even wheel the wheelchair himself. It was, he was already on the motor. Um, at age of 28, there was, he was no, not going to have his own children or anything like that. May never marry. Um, prospects of life, probably not that long. But he was a counselor. And you can imagine what it was like to go see Chris, the counselor. When you're dealing with some really hard stuff in your life and you come into this 28-year-old guy who's in a wheelchair who can't move, he could barely talk, but he could. And you sit there and you kind of go, wow, okay, I guess my problem's not as bad <laughs> than, than that. We tend to kind of look towards somebody else that might be able to empathize or understand what we're going through. And that's what we're going to kind of begin our journey with this week and ongoing over the next uh, six weeks or so. What do we do when we're the person? Like, you're it. Nobody's had a more horrible, horrible, you know, uh, painful, suffering life than you. Where do you go if you're like it? Well, you go to the next person, if there is a next person, and there is. The problem when you think about, when you think about the question, if there's a loving God, why do bad things happen to good people? And I've chewed on this question for many, many, many years. Like I said, I've been in ministry for a long time. I've seen suffering in other people's lives and, and I've the same thing, even the little petty little suffering that I've gone through, you know, it's all relative to your own experience, but we've all probably at one time in our life going, God, please do something. God, where are you? You know, and seeing other people going through hard things and just reading through scripture and understanding and try to understand God who is all powerful, who's loving and they're suffering the world. God gave me clarity over something that was right under my nose the whole time. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And the thing about it is, is, is thinking about suffering through the lens of Jesus. Yeah, none of us are perfect. None of us, you know, have done anything, you know, uh, perfect in our lives. But Jesus has. And the, the thought kind of crossed my mind. And this was a thought right here. The very worst to the next slide here. The very worst, um, go to the next slide here. Yeah. The very worst thing happened to the very best person to address your suffering. And it kind of blew my mind for a moment there in thinking about suffering is horrible. There's no doubt about it. And a sovereign God, who's also a loving God, decided that the best path towards working through our suffering is to choose for himself, which he didn't have to. He chose to suffer. That the very best person who's ever lived on this planet has suffered the most. He has suffered injustice. I mean, think about it. They killed him. What did Jesus do his whole ministry? He told people about the good news of eternal life, that God is ushering in his perfect, beautiful kingdom. And he went around healing blind people, helping people walk, giving hope, and the injustice of not doing anything wrong. He was killed. He was rejected by his own people. He was, he was rejected, and, and his own core group of people who lived with him for three years, they turned tail and they ran. He understands what it means to be emotionally and relationally rejected by other people. He understands what it's like not to, you know, experience what we would consider the fulfillment of life. He didn't have much money. He didn't have, he didn't go on cruises. He didn't go, he live in big palaces and have these amazing experiences that money can buy. He didn't have any of those things. He never married, didn't have kids. He died when he was young. And he also understands suffering, physical suffering. The Romans created the cross to make you fear them because they saw in the cross the most heinous way for you to die that would make anybody fall in the line. 
So even physically suffering. So the very best person experienced the very worst thing. Why? To take care of our own suffering. In fact, if you go back and you look at the words of Jesus, you look at the words of the early church, do you know how much suffering is, is talked about in there? Unfortunately, oftentimes in the American church in particular, we kind of negate everything. Now, let's not just talk about suffering. Let's talk about these five things. Put your faith in God. You'll have perfect health, lots of money, and you'll wear the, the American dream if you just trust God. But if you go and you read the letters of Paul and of Peter and of James, and you see the Gospels and talking about Jesus, what Jesus talked about, he talked a lot about the brokenness and the suffering of this world. That Jesus Christ came into this world to take care of our suffering. John 3.16. Y'all have heard of John 3.16, especially older, back in the days. They used to always see it in the, in the football stadiums or whatever. Jesus said this in John 3.16. Jesus is a quote from him. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And eternal life in a relationship with God. So we look at that and we think about it. And oftentimes we don't think about the excruciating suffering that that took place. For God gave his son over to suffer excruciating pain. To suffer a lot. Emotionally, physically. And, and it's kind of weird. And we're going to kind of address this over the next six weeks. Suffering is kind of weird. In fact, if you go back and you read the prophet Isaiah, who, who lived 700 years before Jesus, he wrote in Isaiah chapter 53, you can go and kind of read through it, that it was God's good pleasure that, it, that, that, you know, that the Messiah would be crushed, that he would suffer. And you would say, that sounds really sick, that, that a father would get good pleasure of his son's suffering. No, it's not about getting good pleasure of his son's suffering. It's over the fruit that comes from his suffering. Because it's in the suffering of Jesus that we have eternal life. You go to Revelation and we find out at the very end of things, there will no longer be any pain or suffering for all eternity. Jesus has been sitting at the right hand of the Father for 1,900 years. It's been 1,900 years since he suffered at all, period. And those who died in the, in the first century, they have not been dealing with suffering at all, period for 1,900 years. So it was the fruit of that suffering that God saw would be good, which would be the salvation of our lives. One is we have eternal life where we no longer have pain and suffering. And even in this life where we can have physical suffering and difficulties in our lives, we can have emotional healing. We can have the healing that happens within us because now we are now knitted together because of the love of God that we find our meaning, our purpose, and being loved by God, by which creates that healing from the hurt and brokenness in our own lives. That Jesus Christ, the whole reason for death, burial, and resurrection is to bring us back into a relationship with God forever to deal with our suffering. Okay? But we know that suffering is hard. Suffering's hard. It just is. One of the things about this life is, Jesus said it point blank, in this world you will have troubles. But, he said, I have overcome this world. And we're going to talk about what does that mean over the next few weeks. But Jesus said, here's reality. Yes, God is all powerful. Yes, God is all loving. And yes, you're going to have troubles in this world. Okay? And these are the things that we are going to process through this next six weeks and really for the rest of our lives. But the first thing that I want us to understand as we begin this journey is number one, is that Jesus understands your suffering. Even if there's nobody else in this world that understands what you're going through, Jesus understands. He understands what it means to be alone. He understands what it means to go through physical pain. He understands what it means to face death in, in the eyes. He understands what it means to see everybody who's supposed to be on your side run away from you. He 
understands injustice, unfairness. It's not fair for the most perfect person to suffer as he did. He understands. And he also understands how hard it is. How hard it is. In fact, when Jesus knew that he was about to die and he was about to go through the gauntlet, he said this in Matthew chapter 26. He said, you know, he went, Jesus went on a little further and bowed his faith to the ground, praying, my father, there's emotion there. There's feeling there. There is, I understand what I'm about to go through and it's going to be horrible. My father, if it is possible, if there is another way, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. If you don't like to, to suffer, you're in good company because Jesus didn't want to suffer either. And you think suffering is hard? You are in good company because Jesus saw that suffering and experience, suffering is hard. What we're going to learn over the next six weeks is that we go through suffering not as a stoic, all right? You know, what is a stoic? And our minds are stoic is tough. Ah, you know, I'm Chuck Norris when it comes to all suffering. Nothing, you know, suffering runs away from me because, you know, I'm that strong in faith. I'm that strong of a, you know, trust in, in God. Nothing, you know, no suffering ever is ever going to bother me. Well, if that's the case with you, then you are better than Jesus. Because Jesus even said, my father, this is horrible. If there's any other way, that would be awesome, right? And then Jesus, though, at the end of the day, he says this, yet I want your will be to be done, not mine. And in Hebrews 12, 2, it says this. See, because of the joy awaiting him, Jesus endured the cross. Now, the joy was not in the cross, the joy was awaiting him over what would happen after the suffering. This world is short term, y'all. So suffering is really going to be short term. He saw beyond the, the suffering and he saw the fruit of the suffering, which was the salvation of mankind. That you and I, 2,000 years later, those of us who accepted the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, there is nothing that can change us or be taken that, take that away from us. It is ours. And it's because of his suffering. It was the joy of seeing us come into that relationship with him. That he endured the cross, uh, disregarding its shame. And now he's seated at the place of honor besides God's throne. But here's the thing that we're going to kind of learn through this whole thing. If there's a big arching, big idea of this whole message series is ultimately what we're going to see from those who, who just went through some really hard stuff like Jesus Christ did, one of the things was the common thread that you will see, that even though they go through hard things, even though they never really wanted to go through things, even though they may not even understood what the outcome of that particular pain is going to be, they chose one very fundamental thing. They chose to trust God. And even Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. This is horrible. This is hard. This is difficult. I'm not sure why I'm going through this particular thing at this moment. But I'm going to trust you. Jesus understood that the death and the suffering that he was going to go through would end up being for the salvation for humankind. What we're going to learn, too, is God never wastes a pain. God uses our suffering not only to help us to grow, but to help other people as well. But it's hard. And it, it wasn't the, Jesus wasn't the only one where, who was honest about how hard suffering is. Hard is hard. The Apostle Paul, we always think of Paul as being like this tough guy, you know, this pioneer. This guy had been through a lot. This guy had been shipwrecked. He has been beaten numerous times. He had been jailed numerous times. He had gone through a lot. Um, and we see at this moment, there was a moment in his time where he was dealing with probably an ailment. It's called a thorn in his side. He was dealing with some form of sickness, and he didn't deal with it like a stoic, like, oh, man, this feels horrible. But you know what? I have faith to move the mountains. I'm good. It doesn't bother me. In fact, he said, having this thorn in his side, in 2 Corinthians 
he wrote this letter to them. And this is what he said here. He said, three different times with this thorn in my side, I begged the Lord to take it away. Three times, right? So this wasn't just once. You know what? Oh, well, God's will be done. It wasn't twice. Well, okay, God's will be done. No, no, he's begging God and he's begging him. The apostle Paul is begging God to deal with his suffering. God, this hurts. God, this is awful. God, heal me. God, heal me. God, this is awful. Do something. God, I beg you, this is awful. And then each time he said, this is the Lord's response to him. My grace is all you need. No, that's not what I was looking for. I want the thorn gone. But God used that particular and allowed that to happen to him because Paul was getting, well, he's dealing with some pride. Things were going good in his life. And so things were going good in his life. He naturally thought that everything must be because of him, whatever one reason or another. But God in his grace, which is kind of weird, and we'll talk more about that later, about God's weirdness and grace of allowing Paul to suffer. Even Paul admits to himself that it was God's grace that he would suffer. Really weird. And it was, but Paul also understood why God was doing this. God was actually graciously putting him back into a position to help him to understand, Paul, you're beginning to get delusional like this is all you. I'm doing this to help you, to remind you that I'm all you need. Because, right, you know, usually I always say that there's really just two things that God is doing in our lives, period. He said, well, God, what are you doing? Really two things. Number one, God is bringing us closer into a relationship with him. So usually if we're begging to God, God, heal me, or God, why? All right, you're talking to me. You, you never talk to me. You know, you just kind of go on in life with, on your own and just kind of dealing your things and stuff like that. You never talk to me, all right? And the second thing that God does through whatever in our lives is to help us to gain more understanding of him by which we become more like Christ. And in this moment, Paul, God was using suffering to help Paul to understand, Paul, 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 I'm all you need, man. Your contentment is not in your pride. Your contentment is not in people thinking how great you are. Your contentment and your strength is when you understand that you just need me. And so now, Paul says, from his own ex experience, I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. Where I just say, okay, God, I'll, I'll just do what you want me to do. And he's not the only one who dealt with this whole thing about pain and suffering. Peter did as well. In fact, when, you know, Peter was the one who, um, just like with the other guys, when Jesus was arrested, what did Peter do? He took off. But he kind of started kind of watching out in the woods to see what would happen with Jesus. So he kind of came in and found himself kind of in the courtyard. And then people were like, hey, aren't you with Jesus? And he's like, hey, I, I have no idea who it is who he is, you know, no, nope, not with him. Hey, aren't you? And then another person, aren't you with Jesus? No, 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 no. And then a little servant girl comes in. Hey, aren't you with Jesus? You know, I curse God if I've ever been with him, right? Really manly stoic move right there by him. He denies Jesus three times. Why did he deny Jesus three times? Because he didn't want to suffer. Because he knew that if I associate myself with Jesus, there's probably going to be some suffering. I don't want to suffer. So this was self-protection to completely lie and disassociate with himself, with Jesus, so that he wouldn't suffer. And then Jesus rose from the dead and him and Jesus came together. And long story short, Jesus forgave him and restored him and all of these things. But Jesus said something to Peter though. Peter, you've seen me raised from the dead. I've conquered death. I've conquered suffering for eternity. But here's the deal you're going to suffer. Because in there we see with Jesus here in, in John, uh, the gospel of John, I tell you the truth. 
Peter, this is Jesus talking to Peter. When you were young, you were able to do as you like. You dress yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and take others, uh, and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. That's code for, Jesus said this, to let Peter know by what kind of death he would glorify God. All right? And then he said to Jesus, and then Jesus told him, follow me, follow me. And then he goes on, and right after this, the next verse, Peter turned around and saw behind him the disciple Jesus loved, which is John, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Good Leonardo da Vinci moment, last supper moment there. And Peter asked Jesus, what about him? Right? So, Basically, what Peter's saying here is like, oh, I'm going to die? What about that guy? Right? You ever like gone through some suffering or pain and you go, wait a minute, I'm going to have to go through that? What about them? Right? And what did Jesus reply to that? If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? And guess what? John is the only one who died of old age. So in other words, Hey, you know what, Peter? You're going to die, and you're going to suffer, and John, you're going to live to a long age. And and, and naturally, you would sit there at Peter, you would kind of go, wait a minute, that's not fair. So I'm going to suffer, and he's not? And what does Jesus say? Hey, man, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Don't focus on them. Don't focus on their story. Don't focus on what's going on in their lives and what's not going on in their life. Focus on me. And this is what he said to him. You follow me. This is your journey, Peter. This is your journey to understand who I am, what I'm doing in this world. This is your journey to be used by me for the salvation of mankind, of of humanity through your suffering. In fact, You say, well, how did Peter process all of that? We know how Peter processed all of that. He wrote a great letter. We studied it about a couple of years ago. I highly recommend to go back and read it. It's called 1 Peter. And that letter talks a lot about trials and suffering and and all of these things. And what you see with, uh, and when you read that letter is a lens through a man who lived his life tunnel vision for the best person who suffered the worst things for his salvation. And in looking at that and understanding what Jesus did in his own suffering that meant what it meant in his relationship to Jesus forever and how his own suffering helps him to understand God better and how his suffering has, was, has been used to impact other people's lives, you see a person who looks at suffering very differently from the person who first ran away and said, I don't want any part of that. In fact, one little section there in that letter in 1 Peter 5, chapter 1, it says this, And now, a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. Peter saying, I saw the sufferings of Christ. And I'm sure he probably even had a conversation with these people probably at once where I saw the sufferings of Christ, but yeah, I kind of saw it from kind of far away. And yeah, I did deny him three times because I didn't want to suffer. But now I've seen my risen Lord. I see what he's doing in humanity. I see his kingdom vision for all eternity. And if he's willing to suffer for me, I'm willing to suffer for him. And if my suffering means salvation for somebody else, then I'm willing to do it. And I too will share in the glory when he is revealed to the whole world. I wonder in that moment while Peter's writing this down, he's thinking about the words of Jesus to him. You know, that, that, you know, that, talking about his own suffering that will bring glory to the Lord. And in this letter, he's, he's writing to them, saying, I was there, I saw his suffering, that suffering means transformation for all of humanity forever. The ushering in of his kingdom, that's not about the brokenness of this world, but the fulfillment of his kingdom that will last for eternity. And so, I too will share in his glory when he's revealed to the whole world. In 1601, a guy, Italian named uh, Caravaggio, painted this just this beautiful picture. And this is a picture of, of Peter hung upside down. 
in a way that shows that, you know, Peter, um, when he was in around 65 AD, he was, he was crucified. But he didn't want to be crucified the same way as the Lord because that would, he just felt like that would be a dishonor to the Lord. And so he chose to be crucified upside down. This painting was painted in 1601, which is really fascinating because what it shows you is something really, something changed in human history. And what changed in human history is this little piece of wood right here. We have them on the both sides right here. We don't understand really the depth of what those things symbolize before Jesus Christ. Those things symbolize criminality. Those things symbolized fear. Those things symbolized power and authority of those who hung you on that cross. Those things were shameful. Poor, the criminals, the worthless, those are the people who get on these things. We don't look at it anymore like that. We see it differently. We see these things as a symbol of love, of sacrifice, forgiveness, eternal life. And this is what Jesus does with suffering, his own suffering and our suffering as well. He takes something that is so horrible and when we allow God to use it, he redeems it. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is no longer in the grave. He's been risen out of the grave. Death, oh death, where is your sting? He sits at the right hand of God without any, without any pain, without any suffering. The cross that was meant to, to get rid of the Jesus movement became the very beginning of a movement to change human history. God took a suffering and he changed it for our own lives. God is still in that. There's times when we may not know, God, why are you doing this at this moment in this time? Why am I going through this? But if we trust him, we may go into the tomb, but God will raise us up out of that to give us clarity and understanding about what he wants us to know about him, about life and about eternity. And the reality of it is, is God may not heal us. He may not. Did you know that Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah? We tend to know Elijah, but Elisha, great man of faith, great man of miracles. Do you know how Elisha died? Elisha died of sickness, he became ill and he died. And you say, you know, here's a miracle worker. Why couldn't, why couldn't he just, didn't he not, not have enough faith? Why didn't he just do? No, it was just God's time. And two weeks ago, I talked about that, that there's a time where it's time for us to go home. And when we see the early church with Peter and with all those other guys and things like that, when they went through suffering, they understood that there was, this is not their world. There's another world to come. And that means that if they were going to be hung upside down or be beheaded like Paul, or they were going to get sick and they were going to die of old, of their bodies just getting old like John, this is not our home. This is not our place. That we have an eternal home of eternal, what they would call rest, rest from the suffering and rest from the deal. But here right now is our time to understand who God is, what life is about, and to see what God wants us to know and for God to use that into the life, to breathe life into other people. Now, I say all of that to say this, Suffering's hard. We don't deal with it as a stoic. We deal with it as human being. We deal with it with the honesty of this is horrible, this stinks, this is hard, this is difficult. Why am I going through this, processing this with this, with our God? And to allow God to go through this journey with us as we go through the hardships of life. In a moment, we're gonna go and we're gonna spend some time just taking a time of response. And what we're gonna do is we have communion on the side. And communion, remember, is to remind us every single week that Christ suffered for us. He's a suffering servant. 
He's a suffering king. He's a suffering leader. And he suffered, and he chose to do it in order to ultimately take away our suffering. Again, may not be our suffering here on this earth, but there will be where we'll no longer have suffering for all eternity. And for this time, this place, when God allows that suffering to take place in our lives by his own power and his own love, we should process that with him. And it's okay to say, God, I really don't want to do this. Take this cup from me. But I hope that we all learn through those moments and times to go, okay, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust that you're powerful. I'm going to trust that you're good. I'm going to trust that this is a weird thing that you're going to help me to process and understand why we're going through this. And, and I'm going to lean on you. And, but I'm going to remind, remind myself at the end that you understand my suffering that you chose to suffer for me, that I have a suffering leader who understands my suffering and I can come to you. We'll also have some prayer partners on our side here at the cross. And I hope that if you come to them, that you may be in that moment where you feel like you're being hung on a cross right now because of the suffering that you feel. And they will love to be able just to pray over you and to pray that God would bring you out of the tomb, the suffering that you're dealing with and raise it up for healing and for clarity and understanding of what God is doing in your lives. Or you can just stay right where you're at and just process these things with God. But process with him. You may be angry. You may be thinking that I'm full of crud right now. And you know what? That's okay. What's not okay is just to sit in it for the rest of your lives. We have a good God who loves us that we can bring even our anger and our bitterness and our disappointments and our frustrations to him because he is a good God. In the back, we also have our baskets for offerings, a place by which we give up to give to God in order for God to go and have an impact in other people's lives. Father, just to be honest with you, I don't like to suffer. I just even look back in my own life. There are times where I know that I have sinned in ways by which I just didn't want to suffer. You know, maybe I lied, maybe I embellished, maybe I stepped away, who knows? There's lots of reasons why a lot of times that we just kind of like, we don't want to suffer. We don't want to suffer. And suffering's hard and it's awful and it's difficult and hard is just hard. So Father, I pray that today, as this is just kind of the beginning of this journey, that we would just learn to lean into you the hard things, that we would lean into each other to encourage each other through those hard things, God. But God, as we begin this journey, I pray, God, that you would remind us that you understand what hard is, not to make it trite, but to understand that we understand the emotions that we feel. You, you understand how hard this is for us. You empathize with us, but you overcome it. So, Father, through this journey, I pray that you would help us to overcome those, those sufferings in our lives. And, God, even if we are not going through suffering right now, that you would just continue to prepare our hearts and our minds for those times in our lives when we will go through those hard things. So, Father, as we spend this moment, just speak to our hearts, speak to wherever we may be, and be with us through your spirit. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.